How many of you have a physical Bible with you today? Um, you don't get extra points. I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just asking. Um, one of the things that I appreciate and that I like about a physical Bible, most of the Bibles that, that I get have um, these maps in the back. In fact, if you want a Bible, if you don't have a physical Bible, there's one in the seat back in front of you, and if you want to take that home, that's officially yours. So if you want a Bible and you don't have one, take that one home with you. But the Bibles that I usually get um, have these maps in the back. Do any of you have the Bibles with the cool maps in the back? So this one has, the reason I like this so much is because this, to me, brings the stories, it gives them a new uh, context. It gives me perspective on kind of what is going on. Um, there's a lot of regions in the Bible and areas that are talked about that we don't have any longer today, or at least we don't call them that anymore. So this kind of gives a really good overview of what we're actually talking about. So my Bible has the path that the Israelites took when they left Exodus and where they traveled, the time in the wilderness, where that took place, has all these different cool maps that where all of Jesus' ministry took place. And I love to take a look at these. If you have a Bible that has these cool maps in it, dig into them. Um, they don't have it in the version app. I looked. <laughs> this is one of my favorite things. That's one of the first things I looked for. They don't have it in the version app. You gotta get a physical Bible. The ones with the maps are like an extra... Two dollars or something, but get the one with the maps. One of my favorite things to look at is the journeys of a guy named Paul. There's a character in the Bible, I call him a character. He is a figure, a real life person in the Bible named Paul. Paul wrote a bunch of letters to churches throughout this region where a lot of the Bible stories took place, and he went on a lot of missionary trips. And as you can see up here on the screen, all these different colored lines indicate where Paul traveled on his different missionary journeys. The red line or the, the kind of darker burgundy line and the blue, that was his first missionary journey. The darker black line is his second journey. The yellow is his third. And the red is his fourth, leading all the way around up through the bottom of Italy and into Rome. And it's interesting to look at this. I love taking a look at especially this map of Paul, where he went the cities that he visited, and to read the stories about what he did. Because as I look at this, I like to think of Paul as this epic hero going out, like the Iliad, going out and single-handedly converting the masses to Jesus Christ, going out on this incredible journey as this solo hero. But then I go and read the stuff that Paul wrote, and I find out that that version, my imagination of what Paul was doing, that's not true. Paul never did his ministry by himself. Paul never did his Christian walk by himself. Paul was very intentional about recognizing the team effort that it was that composed his ministries and the things that he did, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his letters, he wrote letters to different churches, and he wrote a letter to a church in Philippi, and a letter to a church in Corinth, and a letter to a church in Thessalonica, and to Galatia. He wrote all these letters to these churches that became these books of the Bible. And in these books of the Bible, in these letters that he wrote, he was very intentional about mentioning these co-workers that he was doing ministry with. In fact, throughout the letters that Paul wrote and in the book of Acts, we're introduced to over a hundred of what Paul refers to as these co-workers that he is doing ministry with. Sometimes these, these other teammates even co-authored these letters and these books of the Bible. Paul usually introduces himself right at the beginning of a letter that he's writing. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, he introduces himself like this. This is a letter from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Sosthenes. This is a letter from Paul, but also from Sosthenes. In the book of Colossians, when he was writing, to, uh, when he was writing a letter to the church in Colossus, in Colossians chapter one, verse one, he says this. This is a letter from Paul. Chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. These letters weren't just from Paul. He wasn't even writing to these churches alone. He was writing on behalf of him and his team. 
In the book of Galatians chapter one, verse one, the letter starts like this. This is a letter from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or by any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead. All the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. Paul loved to recognize and honor the teammates that he was doing ministry with. And in fact, he loved to talk about these people using the Greek prefix that means co or fellow. He referred to them very often as co-partners or co-servants, fellow soldiers, fellow prisoners, co-laborers. And at the end of all of his letters, he intentionally begins another list of names honoring and recognizing all the people that were doing ministry along with him, like the credits at the end of a movie. He was giving honor and recognition and credit to all of these people who were doing ministry right alongside of him. But how many of us pay attention to the credits at the end of a movie? Unless you're sitting through because you know there's an end credit scene, like a post credit scene. And even then, you're scrolling through Facebook or Instagram while the credits are playing so that you can just see the scene at the end. The credits and the names in the credits we typically don't pay too much attention to, but Paul was being very intentional about listing, highlighting the people who he was partnering with because they were required even for Paul, this figurehead of the Bible, who wrote almost the entire New Testament, even for Paul, he was recognizing and highlighting, I've gotta have these people with me. I'm so thankful that all these people are with me, that they're helping me here doing ministry. Paul needed these people in order to do ministry effectively. Paul was basically saying, we need a team. You need a team. Having a team is essential. As people of the church, you need a team. Doing ministry at all, if you want it to be effective, you need a team. And more important than that, as a Christian, you need a team. Walking in your daily Christian walk, you need a team. Is there water? Can I have this? I'm sorry. It's awful. Oh, that's all right. As a Christian, you need a team. I did swimming um, as I was growing up, not like I was just often in the pool. I, I competitively swam very often when I was growing up. I think from like age seven to 16 or 17, I did competitive swimming. Um, and very, I say very seldomly, I'm pretty sure the number is zero. Zero times did I set any records by anything that I did by myself. I was pretty fast and could win some of the races, but I never set any records alone. I did set some records on teams though. Because even though I was fast in certain things, what, do you remember the stroke that I was awful at? The breaststroke. If I was doing an individual medley, for those of you who don't know swimming stuff, you swim the butterfly, the backstroke, the freestyle, and breaststroke. You swim all three of those. We were coasting pretty solid for the first little while until it got to the 100 yards that I had to swim breaststroke, and then everybody else was gonna pass me. All the people that I had passed were gonna pass me, and the people who were still in front were gonna get way farther in front. Breaststroke, I was awful at. So anytime that I competed alone, maybe I won, Maybe I lost, but I definitely wasn't setting any records. But the times that I did set some records is because even though I sucked at breaststroke, Kevin Miller didn't. He was awesome. <laughs> and even though I was decent at butterfly, Josh Torchia, he was awesome at butterfly. So when we all teamed up and got to do this medley race, suddenly we went from, oh, this person's good at this, but not so good at that, and this person's good at this, all of our strengths begin to combine together, and we won. Not only did we win, but we would set records and go leaps and bounds farther than we, any of us could alone because we had a team. Too often, we think of Christianity, our Christian walk, 
like swimming in the Olympics. Some events I do by myself. Some events I do as a part of a team. Some swims I just do alone and it's just me in the lane and it's only me against the other people and then some of them I team up with. A, that's not the way it works. This isn't like that. This should be like football. It's just the team. If you win, you won as a team. There's no solo winners. If you lose, you lose as a team. There's no solo losers. But if you're all by yourself, you're going to lose. If you find yourself standing at midfield and the entire Tennessee Titans offense is standing in front of you and you're alone, you're hosed. (laughs) There's no chance for you. Being on a team is the only way that we can win because the enemy that we have doesn't fight fair. He does not see any honor in one-on-one. The Bible says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Do you know how lions hunt? They hunt in groups. The pride goes out there. And the group of lions, because a solo lion can't take down an elephant. But the group of them working together, the group of them can. You need a team. We need a team. And I want to talk about three things very quickly today. Teams make ministry more effective. Teams make ministry more effective. The Christian church biblically has three, it serves three main purposes. Glorifying God, growing with one another, and evangelizing. Those are the three main purposes of the church. And as Jesus was establishing the church in his ministry, he put together a team. He put together a group of 12 guys, very diverse, from all different kinds of backgrounds, with all different kinds of strengths and weaknesses. He knew that championing this message required a team. Jesus picked 12. In order to do this effectively, I'm not going to be here the whole time, so in order to do this effectively, I'm going to need a team of people who I can then send out to make teams of people who can then send out so that this message can be spread. Listen, friend, if Jesus put together a team, you cannot do it alone. If Jesus put together a team, we weren't designed having all of the characteristics that we need to effectively be the church in ourselves. We need to put together a group of people around us. Romans chapter 12, verse 8, or excuse me, verse 4, starts like this. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace... God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. These we call spiritual gifts. These are spiritual gifts, all dispersed differently from God to each of us. There are seven listed here in Romans chapter 12. Prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, and kindness. This is one of the letters that Paul wrote, and he outlines these seven spiritual gifts. When he wrote another letter to the, book, or, or, to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he has a completely different list of spiritual gifts because our spiritual gifts, the gifts of the church, are not just limited to seven So he goes through in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 starts like this. He says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Is anybody lacking in each of us? Each of us is each of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us. So, why does it say why? So we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. 
to another. The same spirit gives the message of spiritual, uh, of special knowledge, excuse me. The same spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. One spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. There are eight spiritual gifts that Paul lists here in 1 Corinthians. Wise advice, special knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, which is the only one that's listed in both passages, discernment, and tongues and interpretation. Why does he give those out? Why are those spiritual gifts given to each one of us, each one of us, each one of us, why are those spiritual gifts given to each one of us? So that we can help each other. So that we can help each other. Well, I don't have any of those gifts. My gifts must be something different. First Corinthians chapter 12, just a few passages later in this same letter, Paul says this in verse 22. Some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important, those are actually the most necessary. I don't feel like I fit in anywhere. Guess what? You are still very, very important. And each of us has a gift. It's not that those people have them and I missed out. Every single one of us has been given one of these spiritual gifts to develop, to help the team. It's all about being a part of a team. If you're on a Super Bowl team and you win the Super Bowl, Everybody gets a ring. Everybody gets a ring. From the first string starting quarterback to the third string kicker, everybody gets a ring. Doesn't matter if you feel the most important or the least important, you're a winner because you're on the team and because everybody on the team has a very special purpose. Because you may not be the first string quarterback. You might feel like you're the third. But at the end of this NFL season this last year, we ended up with a lot of third string quarterbacks that were starting. Everybody has a special spot on the team. We need the team because everybody has something that the rest of the team needs. There is a, um, there's a series of movies called The Avengers. Have any of you seen The Avengers movies? Like the modern Avengers movies? Um, it's a team of superheroes that are collaborated into this one team and they fight the, the problems of the universe and the bad guys of the universe. And in the very first Avengers movie, one of the Avengers, Iron Man, is having a conversation with the big bad guy of the movie. And he's going, listen, I know we're not winning right now. I understand that we're not winning right now, but you haven't met everybody on our team yet. The whole team has yet to assemble, and let me tell you, you're in for a, a world to hurt when everybody gets together. And the bad guy says, I have an army. And Iron Man's response is, we have a Hulk. <laughs> you have yet to meet the entire team, because alone, that one superhero was not able to fulfill and accomplish all the things that he needed to. But he also knew that the team was coming. The team was getting ready to assemble. So no matter what was in front of them, the army could be ready in front of them. But he goes, oh, it's all right. I can't do this alone, but I'm not alone. I have a team surrounding me. Whatever problems we face as a church, the things that we find the most difficult, it doesn't matter. Because guess what? I'm not doing this alone. We have an Ed. We're good to go. We could face a certain issue that I can't solve alone, that you can't solve alone. But guess what? We have a calling. We're good. There are things that we face in life that, that feel like we're facing them alone, but in reality, we should have this team of people around us. The team is made better because of everyone, 
And everyone is made better because of the team. Do any of you remember the power team? Do any, have any of you seen the power team? Oh, I'm about to open your eyes to a brand new genre of entertainment. Do we have time to do this? This is not in my notes anywhere. Um, yeah, we'll go there for just a minute. The power team. Let me tell you about the power team. Imagine, hmm, imagine a strongman competition mixed with the production of professional wrestling mixed with gospel message. The last one seems out of place, and it kind of felt like it was at the time as well. It was this group of bodybuilders, these hugely buff, like big time swollen bodybuilders who would go around spreading the message of Jesus Christ. But before they got to that bit, they would break baseball bats over each other's backs and they would lay on beds of nails and put like cinder blocks on one another and then someone would come and like karate chop it in half. It was this, Google the power team when you get home. I'm not giving it justice based on how I'm describing it. But it was this group of guys, this big group of big old dudes who would do these incredible feats of strength they would get frying pans and like fold them in half and be like, yeah, that's Jesus power or something. <laughs> but they would go through these, these entire services and, and do this incredible show and then they would spread the message of Jesus and then there would be a gospel message at the end. For one Winterfest years ago, we had a member, like a former member of the power team who was the main speaker for the Winterfest. It was pretty cool. I mean, I thought it was kind of cool because I'd seen the power team. None of these kids had any clue, like you all, who the power team was. So it was not very interesting. Um, he was a big dude, but he was like a used to be on the power team, so he was also just like a big dude. <laughs> but he came out and did the spiel and was talking about like uh, he was giving a message talking about this passage of scripture, and then at the end, like the big strength demonstration was he got a baseball bat and broke it, which is cool. I mean, I can't break a baseball bat. I don't know if any of you can break a baseball bat, but alone out of the context of like the power team demonstration where they're like jumping off of ladders and breaking cinder blocks on people's heads and stuff, out of that context, it was just this weird like used to be power team guy who broke a bat for some reason and we were all very confused out of context, that dude really needed the team because the message of what he was trying to get across really didn't seem to land, kind of like, kind of like this. Here we go. Go back to those passages that Paul was writing. Where did these gifts come from? These spiritual gifts. Can you toss up uh, the passage from Romans 12 up there? Can we get Romans 12? As Paul was writing to this, to this group in Rome, over and over, go down again. Let me, let me read it for you. Uh, Romans chapter 12, let me get verse six. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things. So if God has given you the ability, and every single one of the ones after it says, so if God has given you this, so if God has given you this, so if God has given you this. If we go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, or excuse me, chapter 12, verse 8, it says, so to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives the message of special knowledge. The Spirit gives, God gives, all of these things come from God, and he has given them to each of us with a specific purpose. Do any of you have keys to a paid-off vehicle? Do any of you have keys? Bring them to me. I want them. <laughs> Can I have yours? Beautiful. Give me those. Keys to a paid-off car. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's see how far this goes. Do any of you have a $100 bill? Do any of you have? Yes! Winner! Can I have this? <laughs> Solid. Do you know why they just gave me those? Because I gave them to them both before service. Those things are mine. 
I gave it to them before service, they're just giving it back to me. Too often we feel like the things that we've been blessed with are our things. Too often the, the, we feel like the things that we've been blessed with are our things. That wasn't his keys, they're my keys. That wasn't her hundred dollars, it was mine. So the gifts that the Lord gives to each of us, he has given to each of us with the purpose of us using it to benefit the body and to give glory back to him. Last week's message, the past couple weeks' message, we're on giving because God wants to use the gifts that he gives us to benefit the team and to benefit his ministry. The team's gifts are intended to benefit you as an individual and your gifts are intended to benefit the rest of the team. You just want me to join a small group. I see where this is going. You just want me to give in the offering. I see where this is going. You just want me to be a part of your ministry team. I see where this is going. Listen up, dude. No. God giving you a gift and you being a part of a team is not God trying to get something from you. It's God trying to do something for you. You need a team to do ministry well, and you need a team to make your spiritual walk more efficient. You need a team to make your own personal spiritual walk more efficient. Doing life alone is hard. And unless you have some sort of God complex, you should know that you cannot do everything you set out to do as effectively as everybody else in the whole world all the time. You can't be the best at everything at all times. Some people are really great problem solvers. Other people are really great encouragers. But sometimes when those people are separated, the problem solvers have really big struggles with being discouraged. And the encouragers have really big problems not being able to know what to do in a situation. But when you partner them together, suddenly the strengths of one cover the weaknesses of the other. And a team is made better because of that partnership together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. Paul writes this. Our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. How weird that would be if you decided, I am fine in myself. I am good alone. I need nothing else. I am the left second toe, and I am good all alone. You would look weird walking down the street. <laughs> Putting bodies together on a team, that's why we were made differently from one another. Each and every one, working alone is pointless and depressing. And that's not my original thought. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse seven says this, I observed another piece of foolishness around the earth. This is the case of a man who is alone, who is quite alone, without a son or a brother, yet he works hard to keep gaining more riches, and to whom will he leave it all? And why is he giving up so much now? This guy is all alone. He has nobody around him, and he is pressing his face into the wall, working, working, working for more with nobody around him. And it says, this is all so pointless and depressing. Verse 9 says, two can accomplish much more than twice as much as one. For the results can be much better. If one falls, the other pulls him up. But if a man falls when he is alone, he's in trouble. Also, on a cold night, two under the same blanket gain warmth from each other. But how can one be warm alone? And one standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three is even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Have you ever gone through a season, a trial, a tough time when you're like, man, I could really use some prayer right now. Man, I could really use some encouragement right now. Man, I, I could really use some guidance right now. I could really use some wisdom right now. I could really just use some help right now. Jesus said this in the book of Matthew chapter 18. I tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers... I am there with them. 
Life is hard. And Jesus kind of promised that it would be. He said, hey, listen, you're going to have a tough time sometimes. It doesn't get easier just because you decided, I'm following Jesus. Yeah. Stuff is going to get difficult sometimes. But we are made better when we're teamed up, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. You might be going through an issue, a struggle, a season of doubt or hurt right now that is going to be solved through the prayers of someone else in this room. We need one another. We've got to be on the same team. The book of Exodus tells this very interesting story in chapter 17. Let me read it to you quickly. It says, while the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men and go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow, I will stand at the top of a hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever his hand dropped, the, Amal- the, the Amalekites excuse me, gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became tired, so he could no longer hold his arms up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on, and then they stood on each side of Moses, holding his hands up for him. So his hands held steady until sunset, and as a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. And the next verse, Moses looks around and he says, hey, somebody write this down. Write this down. Write down what just happened because we won and I was too weak to do my job. We found victory, but it wasn't because of me. I had one job to do and I was too weak to do it alone. So these two dudes made a way to make it possible. These two came and physically supported me so that our team was able to have victory. You need a support system. You need somebody who's praying for you. You need someone who you are praying for. You've got to have a team around you that you can encourage and build up and speak life into and pray over and read scripture over. We need that together. James chapter five, verse 16 says, confess confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces Wonderful results. Galatians chapter six, verse two says this. Share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. I didn't give verse three to the people of the media, but verse three of the same passage, the very next verse says, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself You are not that important. That's Bible. I don't need to be on the team. (laughs) Listen, fool. (laughs) Paul says, you ain't that important. We're not all the same, and it needs to be that way. That's why God created us uniquely. And Jesus prayed that even though we were all unique and different, that we would be united as one. In John chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus is praying and he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who, were, who will ever believe in me through their message. That's us. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying for unity, like God, like me and you, like the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're very, very distinct, different personalities of God, but they're one, like a pretzel. It's got three holes in it, but it's still one dough, just kind of mixed up all together. He said, I pray that you are one, that you are united, that they would be one distinctly different, but united together. United to do what? 
united to follow the captain of our team. United to follow the captain of our team because every team has a captain. We are a team under the direction of the captain of the Lord's army. That's what the Bible says. He sets the mission. He points out the goal. A very united team can reach the wrong goal line if they're not listening to their captain. You can successfully reach a place that you're not supposed to be if you're not listening to the captain. This is important. Listen. As a church, we can be very united and moving forward in the wrong direction if we don't have discernment to listen to the captain. So what's the goal? Where is he leading us? The mission, the goal of what we are to do is two things. Let me read them to you quickly. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus gives us what we can call the golden rule. Someone asks him, teacher, which is the most important commandment? What's the most important rule? And he says this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. He said, love God, follow his commands, love people. And the second mission that he gives us, the Bible, and in, in if you're looking at like the chapter headings of your Bible, the Bible refers to as the Great Commission. Because Jesus gives his final statement on earth before he ascended into heaven. And he said this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's the mission that our captain has set us on? He said, love God, love people, and make disciples. Disciples with an S. It's not just me pouring into one so that that one can pour into one so that that one can pour into one. Jesus picked 12. Get on a team. Better yet, make a team. And teach them how to accomplish this mission. There's an acronym that's very commonly used for team, T-E-A-M, and it's together everyone accomplishes much. For this purpose, we're gonna change that to together, everyone accomplishes the mission. Together, everyone accomplishes the mission. There was a game that I played growing up um, called Star Fox. It was on the Nintendo 64, the greatest gaming console of a generation. And you were basically a fighter pilot going through space to different planets um, fighting bad guys. And at the end of each level, at the end of each mission, you were awarded with one of two achievements. If you made it to the end and you were still alive, your team could have been all dead behind you and the, the, the planet that you were on was laid waste behind you. You just made it to the end and you were still barely alive. You got the achievement, mission complete. But if you made it to the end... And throughout your journey, you protected your teammates, you were working together, you accomplished the different goals that you had set over the course of this level, and you made it to the end, not just barely squeaking by and you were the only one left alive, but you made it all the way to the end and your team was thriving, you earned the achievement mission accomplished. Because at the end of the race, by the time we get to the end of this physical race that we're going on, it's not about just who can make it to the end without dying. It's not about just who can make it to the end without having everything just obliterate and fall apart before you. Can we work together as a team? Can we build one another up? Can I pray for you? Can you pray for me? I need prayer too. Standing up here does not negate the need for prayer. Please, send it. Can I pray for you? Can you pray for me? 
Can your spiritual gift be something that encourages me, that speaks into my life? And can my spiritual gift be something that encourages you? Can we work together as a team? Can our, can our group come together so that our spiritual gifts are uplifting to one another, so that together everyone can accomplish the mission that Jesus set before us? Will you stand with me this morning? So my first closing. There are um, beasts of burden, uh, horses that are called Belgian plow horses. If you've never heard of a Belgian plow horse, it is very, very stocky, um, thick, muscular horses, kind of like the Budweiser horses that, that pull the Budweiser wagon. Those, those are called Belgian plow horses, similar to that. They're called Belgian plow horses. They have the capacity to pull on average of 8,000 pounds. They have about an 8,000 pound pulling power. Huge, incredible, powerful animals. If you grab two random Belgian plow horses and you yoke them up together, they now have the capacity to pull 8,000 plus 8,000 should be 16,000, right? My math right? 8,000 individually, you team them up together, they got 20, they got, uh, 16,000. In reality, you pick two of them, team them up together, put a plow behind them, they now have 24,000 pounds of pulling power. As much as three times what the individual could plow. Just random ones that you just put together. Now, if you found two Belgian plow horses that you trained to work together with one another, that they've been trained since they were young to pull where the other is struggling and to walk together and to pull in step with one another so that they are the most effective team, you find two of those that have been trained together and you yoke them up together, 32,000 pounds of pulling power. Mathematically, it doesn't make sense. But for some reason, more than four times the power of the individual, when we have a team come together with one united purpose, who's working together to accomplish that goal. Love God. Honor his commands. Live according to the things that he teaches. Love his people. Show love and affection to those that are around you. And spread his word. Can we do that together? You have spiritual gifts that I need. I have spiritual gifts that you might need. And when Jesus was establishing what his church looked like, he said, I gotta build this team. I want them to work together. I want them to be one. I want them to be unified so that the church together can accomplish the mission to go and spread the gospel to the nations and to strengthen one another spiritually and to praise him with everything that we have. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I pray that you would empower us as the church today. We might feel strong or we might feel weak on our own, God, but that doesn't even matter because you haven't designed us to be on our own. You've designed us to be walking through our spiritual walk, walking through ministry, moving forward as a church in tandem with those around us, with those people who you have placed here and who you have given special gifts according to your purposes so help us to partner together. Help us to partner together to be a part of the same team working towards your goal, God, to love God, to love you, to praise you, to follow after your commands, and to live for your glory, to love people, to show others the love of Jesus Christ, and to share with them your words so that they can come to know you as well, God. Embolden us in our ministry here at the church empower us to work together better and God spiritually fill us so that over and over and over we can trust in you, we can be obedient in how we give our gifts and how we give our time and how we give our finances and how we speak life and love and prayer and encouragement to those people around us. Allow us, God, to accomplish much, not because we're powerful, but because we're on the same team working towards your purposes and through you, we can do all things. And so we'll give you all the praise. And it's in Jesus' name that we all said, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Consider yourselves dismissed.